What a great prayer and adoration for the Lord. He's worthy. I want to invite you to turn to Genesis 4 as we are wrapping up then this morning a 12-week series that we've been in in the uh, beginning, uh, Genesis, looking at some foundational elements and uh, thoroughly enjoyed this study. I hope you have as well. And we're going to be jumping in the next week then into a series of the book of Ephesians, which I am thoroughly looking forward to. And so if you want a little homework, uh, you can start reading ahead to the book of Ephesians and familiarize yourself with it. Familiarize yourself with kind of, there are so many different interesting topics that Paul is going to address in there, and, um, but just a great book. But today I want to look at one final foundational element um, that, that I see here, and, and we could take more time and go through and look at the flood and, and look at the foundation of nations and all those things, but I want to deal one more here today with the foundation of a family legacy. And it's really a, um, a, a, a directional shift, whether uh, a family is going to pursue after the world or pursue after God. And we see that theme throughout scriptures of a choice of what's the direction that I want to choose for me and my family. I, I think immediately then of, of Joshua. Uh, Joshua and who and Joshua 24 is reminding the people after they've come into the promised land and they've conquered it and they've taken the cities and they've divided up amongst the 12 tribes. And then he reminds them and God says in Joshua 24 and verse 13, he says, I've given you a land, this is God speaking, I've given you a land for which you did not labor and, and, and cities for which you did not build and you dwell in them and you eat of the, fruit, of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. And so he's highlighting, I've taken care of you, I've blessed you. And then Joshua speaks and challenges the people with a personal application in verses 14 and 15. He says, now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the God that your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so that sentiment of that foundation of which direction am I going to pursue? For myself, for my family, what's the legacy and the direction that I want us to have that we're going to pursue after? And there's a personal decision in that. And so we're going to kind of break that down as we see really in Genesis 1 through 3, a similar kind of sentiment with we see the goodness of God as he's created man and put him in a perfect environment and yet man sinned. And then we come into chapter 4 and we're going to see how that moves out from there. We read of them having children. It's here that we begin to see the divide, the direction of life. The corrupted sinful heart is now becoming evident in the pleasure of walking with God in the garden, which is seen in chapters two and three is now a struggle. So I remember when I was in high school, uh, we had to learn the, uh, the poem by Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. How many of you learned that? poem when you were in school, The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. Remember that poem? The idea is of coming to a fork in the road, and there's two roads diverging there, and you cannot travel both. You cannot go down both. And at the same time, you must choose which way you're going to go. Really, in Genesis 4 and 5, we're going to see a contrast of one direction of a family going down one road and a direction of another family going down another road. The consequences are stunning and are, are, uh, are irreverse or are, are, are just difficult to, to miss here. And so really the, the, the two roads have very different endings. In fact, you could put, if you were to put Cain's family under a heading, you could look at it in verse 16 where it says of Cain, that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. That's the direction he went, and we never see him come back. Or you could look at then the line of Seth, which is a godly line that God was going to bless, and they pursued after God. And we see in verse 26, 
speaking of his family. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, his name was Enosh. And then man began to call on the name of the Lord. Two very different directions. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. And then man began to call on the name of the Lord. Two different directions, two different legacies. And so we're here in chapters 4 and 5 dealing with that and looking at what, what is the ramifications of that. And what I want to do is I'm going to give us kind of a series of contrasts. We're going to kind of break this down. We're going to see the contrast between Cain and Abel and the differences of, uh, of their faith and their direction. We're going to look at the difference between uh, then Cain and Seth, the next brother who was going to carry the, the, the godly line and their families and their faith. And then we're going to look at the fifth generation from Cain, the fifth generation from Seth. We're going to compare Lamech and Enoch. And we're going to see these three contrasts as we see one direction of a family going down one road. And we see a direction of another family going down another road. How do we determine where we're going to go with our families? How do we help direct them where they need to be? And so we're going to see an important foundation this morning. And my desire is that we'll check our pathway and determine which road are we on. And here's the good part. Let me say this from the beginning. Here's the good part. You may say, man, it seems like I'm on the wrong road. I'm the line of Cain. I'm going the wrong direction. As we just sang through several songs this morning, his mercy is more. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And so even if you say, man, I've, I've, I've made some Cain-like decisions or some Lamech-like decisions, hey, the good part is, is it's never too late to seek forgiveness and to get back on the right road. Today could be that day to make that choice of getting the right path, the right road with Jesus Christ. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll break this down this morning. Father, I pray that you would guide our time this morning. Lord, we can clearly see in your word as you lay out this clearly for us, the differences of directions of following you or following the world and the ramifications, the consequences of that are stunning. So God, I pray that you'd stir us, that we'd say, no, I want to, I want to be like Joshua for, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I want to be like Seth and his line that we're going to call on. We're going to proclaim the name of the Lord in our home and in our lives. So God, would you, would you stir that in us today? We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's look at the first contrast then. We're going to look at Cain and Abel's faith. And again, we're going to contrast these two, and it really breaks down for us in, in, in verses 3 through um, 7, uh, or really through verse 15. But really, we kind of get a jump into it in verses 1 and 2, um, and some quick details about who is Cain and Abel. It says, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. He said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, and this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And so we, we get this little bit of an intro to who these two are. They're both the sons of Adam and Eve. And um, we begin here finding out that for the very first one is, is born is, is Cain. Adam and Eve conceive, and they have this little boy, Cain. And, and, and can you imagine as parents, for the very first time, looking down at their little child, and there's such hope and expectation. In fact, uh, they, they name him Cain, which means acquired. Uh, and so it's, in, in light of God's promises, it's though they believe that he was the promised deliverer from chapter 3, verse 15. And as the essence of, we got him. We, we got the line. We got the one who's going to, Bring the deliverance. Well, I think in the context of this child and they're naming him as well as the context of the text, um, I, I believe that this would be their first child. And I would say that as, as a foundation for procreation here, the foundation for obedience and, and having children is really laid right here for the very first time in Scripture. And I would say that because... As a theological position, if they had had children before Cain, then when Adam sinned, the Bible says through Adam, when he sinned, all men sinned, we'd have a problem with a, a, a progeny or a line of children 
who had not been inherited sin through Adam. And the Bible says that through Adam all sin. And so if, he had, if they had children before Cain there in the Garden of Eden, we'd have a problem there uh, with that foundation. So I believe that this is the very first child ever born in the world is Cain. I don't think the name as well indicates that because of that meaning we acquired it. We got the, we got the receiving of God's promise. And as well, it seems as if after they sinned and were cast out of the garden, this all happened very quickly, sequentially. They sinned, they received consequences, God cast them out of the garden, and then in the process of time, they had a child. So, going from there then, um, another thought that I just want to kind of give a, as a thought on this, is we sometimes think about Cain and Abel in the garden or out in the fields, and we think of maybe two young men who are maybe in their low 20s, two brothers and, you know, not getting along real well. And we think that there's possibly nobody else on the earth besides Adam, Eve, Cain and Abel. I tend to not think that way either. Um, I don't think that would be the case. Uh, one, we're told that they're mature now, that they are keeping the ground, that they're mature in their abilities and, and, um, and, and are keeping the... Uh, a flock with Abel and tiller the ground, and they seem to be somewhat independent in that. And not to mention that Adam and Eve were of, um, of age from the very beginning of their lives to be able to procreate. It wasn't as if they had to wait another 20 years till they would be old enough. They were, they were of age. And so it's very likely at this time, by this time that these boys are older, that there's already numerous sons and daughters that are born by the time of Cain and Abel in the, gar in the fields here, and likely very much family. In fact, it's very possible that Cain is already married at this point. And, um, and so, just as we think about this, because you think about it as well, then after Abel is killed, chapter, uh, at the end of the chapter, it tells us that, that, uh, Cain, that Adam and Eve have Seth. And it tells in chapter 5 that Adam, Adam was 130 years old when he had Seth. And so it seems like that it's very possible that Cain is even at this point 100, over 100 years old. Now we don't often think about that because our children's church materials have always given us a picture of Cain and Abel in their early 20s and nobody else around. But I think there's a case for it, nothing to be dogmatic on, but I think there's a case for the fact that there's already multitudes of people on the earth at this point. Now, let's look at the, the, the challenge here. The challenge of worshiping God as God. Are they going to do what God says? So we go in then from verses 3 through 7, and it tells us that, that, that um, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground of the Lord, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So it tells us that they both bring their offerings. And Cain being a tiller of the ground. He brings some sort of, uh, of produce. Whether it was vegetables or fruits or whatever it might have been. And Abel being a keeper of sheep. He brings a lamb. And God accepts the lamb sacrifice. The lamb offering. But not Cain's. But the question here arises, it must be considered, is why? Not why was it accepted or not accepted, but why did they even bring offerings in the first place? Well, why would they even think that this is something that we should do? Um, and so, uh, was it that they were instructed on what kind of offerings to bring? Was Cain actually being rebellious in this situation? Was it just simply they had no idea and... And God's just not being really fair to Cain. Well, I, I don't think that these men just dreamed up this idea of bringing offerings. But it was rather instructed to them either directly from God or through Adam of what God expected. And I would say that based upon the authority of God's word in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 4. Where it says, by faith. Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. Faith acts in response to the word of God. 
So there had to have been a command and Abel, by faith, he took that command and he acted. That's why he's declared in a righteous manner, because he did that which he was commanded to do, which was right. And so I believe that there was clearly, this is what God expected of them, to have this blood sacrifice, the death of a substitute. What well, says there that God then respects his, and he does not respect Cain's. The word there, respect, Sha'a, has the idea of to, to look at. And so basically it has the idea of God looks down and he accepts and is pleased with Abel's, but he turns his back on Cain's. This isn't what I told you to do, Cain. This isn't what the command was, and he had disobeyed. You see, here's the thing. I want you to know that Cain was not an irreligious person. He was still bringing offerings. He is still coming before God. He wanted to offer God something. But the problem came in that he didn't offer what God told him to offer. He wanted to make God be what he wanted God to be. He didn't want to let God be God. He didn't want to let God determine how he should be worshipped and who he is and the standards for which he is. Cain says, I, I like you, God. I like you, and I, I like you having you in my life, and I like going to church, and I like doing the things like that, but I, I still want to do what I want to do, and I want to kind of mold you into the image that I want you to be. This is the very first instance of idolatry. To make God into an image that you desire to be. I'm going to mold him. I, want to, I like God, but I like him to be as I want him to be. And I don't want him to be as he says he is. That's exactly what Cain is doing here. That's why later on in 1 John 3, it states, uh, talking about how God sees us as evil, it says, not as Cain who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. So, so why does he do that? What's behind the aspect of, of not letting God be God? What's behind that is pride. I should be God. I should be able to determine what, I, what the standards are. I should be able to determine what I do with my life because I should be God. Pride. It's, it's, an, it's, an, it's not being willing to submit myself to God and His commands and His authority. Pride says that. It's the exact same thing that Satan did. He did not want to respect God's authority anymore. And so by pride, he rebelled against God. So Abel was by nature just as much a sinner as Cain, but God accepted it because Abel offered it in faith in response to God's word. Had nothing to do with Cain's efforts, had nothing to do with that this was, you know, this was bad produce. It had everything to do with this was what God's requirement was. Well, let me kind of illustrate that if I could. How many of you are, are NFL fans are going to watch the Super Bowl tonight? How many Kansas City Chiefs fans? How many Niners? I can't believe you have any Niners fans in here. Um, so let, let's say that you are, a, let's just say you're a big fan. And, and I'm going to say Kansas City Chiefs because that's who I want to win tonight. So, so you're going to go to Super Bowl 54 down in Miami. And you are so excited and, and you are one of those dedicated fans. You've got the jerseys and you've got all the stats and you've got everything you know about the teams and you're ready to go to this game. And so you go down to Miami and you go to the Hard Rock Cafe uh, uh, Stadium, uh, which is the name of the stadium down there in Miami. And you go to the turnstile and the ticket person says, can I help you? You say, yeah, man, I am so excited about going to this game. I've been waiting to go to this game. And I'm going to come to this arena and the stadium and watch the Kansas City beat up on the Niners. Well, do you have your ticket? No, no, I don't have a ticket. But don't you, I mean, I know everything about these players. I know everything about what's going on here. And the guy, the guy will say, if you don't have a ticket, you, you can't come in. This is the requirement to get in the stadium is you have to have a ticket. Okay, so you go out and you leave there and you think, well, I'll, I'll go make a ticket then. So you hire this person to go on their computer and they design for you the awesome looking ticket. I mean, it's got embossed and it got the, the gold and all that stuff on there. And it says Super Bowl 54 ticket. Got, got my ticket. So you print that out and you come back and you go to those turnstiles and you hand to the, the ticket person, here's my ticket. Now, what are they going to do? 
They're going to say, what is this? This is not the right ticket. But you don't understand, I went and had this printed up. I mean, look how nice this is. This is a great looking ticket. You said I needed a ticket. Here's a ticket. Yeah, but I said you needed the ticket that was approved by the owner of this stadium. Approved ticket by the NFL. There is a standard by which is required for you to come in here. Yeah, but, yeah, but my ticket's better. And remember, I, I know all this stuff about these games and I, I should be let in. They gonna let you in? Probably not. Because you didn't come by the authority and obedience to the authority that was required. The reality is the same way. God authority and the only ticket into heaven is perfect righteousness. He says, you want to follow me? You want to be in a right relationship with me? It, it demands perfect righteousness. He said, well, I don't have that ticket. You know what? None of us do. Then up comes while you're standing there, Jesus Christ. He says, I have perfect righteousness. And I'm willing to give you my perfect righteousness. I die on the cross for your place. I, no man comes to the Father but by me. I'm your ticket. And we'll change places if you'll trust me. If you'll believe in what I did for you. And everybody has a choice. You can either say, no, nah, I'm going to trust what I do. I, I, I got my thing. I'm going to go my way. I'm going to do it my, my me method. Or you can say, I, I trust Jesus Christ. Cain wanted to make God fit his mold. He wanted to make the standard be what he wanted it to be. God says it doesn't work that way. I'm God, and I determine what the standards are. And so his sacrifice is not accepted, and he's rejected. He's angry. In fact, his countenance falls, it says. He's, he's angry at this whole situation. And so the Lord comes to him, it says, and asks him, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desires for you. But it sh you should rule over it. He starts to ask Cain questions. Now, it's interesting. God doesn't ask questions because he lacks information. God asks questions because he wants to lead us to understand truth. So he's trying to get Cain, who had rebelled in disobedience... He's still endeavoring to get Cain to see his ways and to change his ways to do right before God. And so he's offering Cain grace. He desires to see Cain repent. Cain, listen, if you do well, if you turn, if you offer the right sacrifice, you'll be accepted. It will be great. But if you don't, sin lies at the door and it's going to try to rule over you all your life. Cain, listen, you can repent, you can change your ways, you can get on the right path if you choose to do so. Isn't God so gracious that even though Cain had rebelled against God, even though Cain had said, I'm going to do it my way, God says, hey, I'm going to offer to you a chance to get it right. You can turn back, Cain. And Cain says, no, I'm not going to do it that way. So he goes his own way. And so he, we see then not only the challenge of worshiping God as God, but the consequences of worshiping man as God. Or we could swap it and say God as man. And so we see Cain's anger after being rejected by, for his sacrifice. And he's out in the field talking with Abel. And it says that he rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Maybe he's thinking in his mind, okay, God, you want blood sacrifice? I'll give you blood sacrifice. Here's blood sacrifice, the blood of my son or my brother. You can have that. He's now turning to, see, this is where God warned him. Listen, Cain, if you don't start to do right, sin lies at the door and it's going to try to rule over you. you see, there's the, there's the thing. One wrong decision of rebelling against God continues to lead to another, continues to lead to another, continues to lead to another. It's a pathway. That's what God just warned him about. Hey, hey, Cain, don't go down that road. But if you repent, you can get off of that pattern and you can follow me. You can get back right. And so then God comes to Cain again. And he asks him, where is Abel, your brother? Again, not because he doesn't know what happened. God knows everything. He's again giving Cain a chance to, to repent 
admit his guilt, admit his sin. But notice Cain says, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? (laughs) In my job? I don't know where he's at. God says, what have you done? His blood cries to me from the ground. I know what happened. Listen, you can't hide your sin from God. What you do on your phone or your tablet, you think nobody knows, you can't hide from God. The Bible tells us in Numbers 32, 23, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. No one ever gets away with this. How foolish for Cain to think that he could get away with this. And God calls Cain on it. And his punishment is then given to him that, no, it's going to be difficult now. The ground is cursed for your sake and you're going to have a difficult time and you're going to be a, you're going to be a, a, a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it's interesting, Cain's response is he says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Oh God, that's not fair. I, it shouldn't be so harsh. Cain, I, I've tried to get you to repent. Try to get you to turn back. But there are consequences for the choices that you make. Listen, you can choose your choices, but you can't choose your consequences. And the quicker we understand that, we don't get the right to say, well, I'm going to choose to go down this path, but I'm also going to choose what the ramifications are. I'm going to choose how this is going to affect my family. I'm going to choose how this will affect my marriage. I'm going to choose how this is going to affect my job and my health or whatever it might be. It doesn't work that way. You can choose your choices. You can choose to obey or disobey God, but you cannot choose the consequences of it. And so Cain goes out from there and we read then, verse 16, then Cain went out from the presence of of the Lord. So there we've seen Cain and Abel's faith in contrast. Let's look at another contrast. Look at, let's look at Cain and Seth's families. So now we're going to see this kind of play out a little bit here and, um, and see Cain's family line now as Cain is leading his family down this course and this next brother, Seth, that comes along um, after Cain. Let's notice, first of all, the family of the flesh. We'll call that Cain's family, the family of the flesh. So Cain goes out from there, it says, and he dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city. And called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. The Enoch was born Erod, and Erod begot Mehujael, and Mehujael begot Methusael, and Methusael begot Lamech, and Lamech took to himself two wives. And the name of the one was Adad, and the second was Zilah. And it goes on and tells us about his family following. Now, I realize that you might be asking yourself the question, where did Cain get a wife? There's some interesting questions that come to us in Genesis. There's a great book, Answers in Genesis has done a lot of neat stuff with this. They have an answers book. There's also a a, a book that I like that by theirs, it says, did Adam have a belly button? And um, a nice little book that just goes through questions of, man, you know, how does this fit? Um, and, uh, I'm allow you to look up that one on your own, um, and get their opinion on it and out of the answers book, uh, or you can go to the answers of Genesis website and see that one. But where did Cain get his wife? If there's just Adam and Eve, and then here comes the boys. Well, the Bible tells in chapter five, verse four, that Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. And you say, well, that sounds kind of odd in that against God's plan isn't much, much later on that God forbids that because right now the genetic code is almost pure. It wouldn't cause deformalities. And so it is, uh, God allowed this in this early stages. And you got to think about, you got to think about that Adam and Eve were um, probably very fertile as a couple. And he lived until he was 960. So, um, 930, I'm sorry. So the ability to have a lot of kids um, was, it probably did pretty well with that. Um, one, the Jewish tradition claims that Adam and Eve bore about 60 children. I think that's way too low. Uh, did you know that, that the actual recorded um, 
uh, world record for one woman with one man of children is? Any guesses? 69 children by one man and woman. It was back in 1707 to 1782. Um, the wife of Fyodor Vasilyev in Shuya, Russia. She had 27 pregnancies. Uh, she gave birth to 16 pairs of twins, seven sets of triplets, and four sets of quadruplets. Wow. That was before they had television. <laughs> well, so, so you think about Adam and Eve. 930 years, and they didn't even have to wait until they were 20 to start having kids. It's from day one. Bam, we're ready to go. And there could have been hundreds of children by Adam and Eve. And if you start thinking through that if in every, if you even waited 25 years to that known to, to raise up, to get married, have children, it is very likely that by the time, uh, I saw one estimate, by the time that Adam died, there was over a million descendants. There's a lot of nieces and sisters and cousins and all that or whatever going on out that, that Cain could have married in there. So anyways, that's just another side note. Um, so let's, let's notice now the line of Cain here. So he goes out and what I just want to really highlight is that Cain goes out from the presence of the Lord and, and he's a pretty prosperous guy. He builds a city has a family, things are going good, his, his family is productive, he's got, he's got kids who are involved with livestock and, and making of metals and craftsmen and bronze and iron and, and one it says over in verse 21, they play the harp and the flute, they're productive people. It's probably pretty good people too. It's not to say that these were just pagans out there, but we notice that they don't ever have a heartbeat to pursue God. Cain's direction of, I, I want God to be a part of my life, but not all of my life, passes down. In fact, it's interesting that, that many of his children have the part of the, the word El in them, which means for God. Mahujael and, and we got Methusael. Um, and then we see this El name. So there was a reference where we still want to acknowledge God but we also want to have the world. We want to go after the things of this life and what we can get today. And so Cain's direction of worldliness was passed down. Matthew Henry notes that grace does not run the blood, but corruption does. A sinner begets a sinner, but a saint does not beget a saint. And it's interesting that, that later on, even the end of, near the end of the Bible, in the book of Jude, that Jude is talking about counterfeit Christians and he says of it in, in Jude 11, he says, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. It's interesting, isn't it? This, this idea of just, you know, put on a face, but there's not a genuine, really a heart to pursue God. So what we learn from there is there's a danger here, just having our families involved in religion, but yet having our feet firmly planted in worldliness. And so we have the contrast here of Cain's family, who again, from a worldly perspective, are productive, they're great achievers. But the contrast is quickly made of another line, Seth's line. And look at it in verse 25 and 26. It tells us, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and his, he named him Enosh, these men, then men began to call on the name of the Lord. So this, this is now a new one. And, and the name of Seth, his name means appointed one. He's a cho chosen line to replace Abel, to be the line through which the, the coming Messiah would come. And it relays to us that as his family starts to grow, it says that their family was calling on the name of the Lord. It's interesting that word there, call, throughout the Old Testament, the, the, the way it's used, the reference for how that's used is in a way of meaning proclaiming, to testify. And so his family is out there and their emphasis is we want to proclaim Jesus Christ or proclaim God. We want to, want to talk about him. We want him to be seen in our lives. 
Whereas Cain walked out from the presence of the Lord and he wanted to be known by what he did in this life. He wanted to be known by what, he, what kind of a, a mark he could leave behind on this world for himself. And so Cain's line is very different from some Seth's. Uh, Seth's family is fully submissive and focused on the Lord saying, well, we don't need all of that stuff. We want to proclaim the Lord. Like the, like the old song, you can have all this world, just give me Jesus. That's, that's the difference. That's the difference. Seth's family says, man, I, I, don't, I don't care if, if we have all the abilities and, and, and have all the cities and all that stuff. We're going to proclaim the name of the Lord. And let it be known of our family, if you know anything about us, that we love God. Yeah, Cain was known by what they did. Seth says, we want to be known by who we are, and we're God's. We're His. Seth said, as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. So we see a very difference there. Is that, so the question is, is that our cry? Is that what we want to pass down to our children, to our grandchildren, to be known by? So we see the contrast of Cain and Abel's faith, Cain and Seth's families, and lastly, um, Let's look quickly at Lamech and Enoch's focus. So here we come back to, and, and, and we find there of two different descendants. And what's interesting is, is they are going to be comparatively the same time period. They're both the fifth generation, uh, seventh generation from Adam, fifth generation from Cain, and the fifth generation from Seth. Lamech is the fifth generation from Cain. Enoch, that we're going to see in chapter 5, is the fifth generation from Seth. So we're seeing now, getting a glimpse of how does this play out down the line? How does this play out further down? Well, let's, let's read it. Let's start at verse 19 of chapter 4, and let's notice a little bit more about Lamech. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. Very first time that we see polygamy in the Bible. The name of one was Adah, and, and the name of the second was Zillah. It's going to tell us about their families and those things. Then notice in verse 23. Then Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. He's bragging to his wives and singing about his ability and his strength. He doesn't care about God's, he doesn't fear God. If Cain was going to be avenged sevenfold, let it be seventy-sevenfold to me. I don't care. A man tried to hurt me, and I killed him. I'm not afraid of God. That's his message. This man who takes two wives, leaves just from the very, I mean, Genesis 2, you've got, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, the plan of a permanency, one flesh, Union that's laid for us in Genesis 2, 24. And just yet now, this is just 620 years down the line from Adam, from creation. You now have Lamech and Enoch. And Lamech says, I'm not going to follow God's plan anymore. If I want more than one wife, I'll take more than one wife. If somebody hurts me, I'll kill them. I'm not afraid of God. I am God. Man, it's stunning how quickly that can change. And it's stunning how quickly that changes. And not only that, but this is still during the life of Adam. Adam's still alive. I mean, they, if they wanted to know the truth, Adam could say, I was there. I walked with God. I watched him bring Eve down to me to marry her. To marry her. I'm telling you guys, this is the truth. They didn't want anything to do with it. They went their own way. And so we have in, in Enoch's line, or in Lamech's line, a pagan generation that has followed. There's an arrogance about sin. Which I think we see so prevalent in our world today. There isn't a remorse about sin. We brag about it. Our world brags about its, its sexual adventures. It, it brags about its crimes, its, its hate. It, it brags about abortions and homosexuality and, and greed and materialism. The world doesn't re repent or remorse about their sin. Our world is in a place just like Lamech saying, let me tell you about what I did this weekend. Right? 
That's, that's the result of a rebellion against God. Listen, you can't, you can't determine where your children are going because you can't determine the consequences of your sin, but you can determine the choices of what you're going to lay up and, and model for them. And so we see Cain's line becoming Lamech. Let's look at what Seth's line, those who said, we're going to call on the name of the Lord. Let's see where their line leads out. And I want you to see the line of Enoch, a pleasing generation. Jump ahead to chapter 5 in verse 18. We're now coming down a few generations and it says that Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. All the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. What does that tell us about him? Well, in the midst of this generation of Lamech and worldliness already starting to, to take off. You, you've got an Enoch. You've got a, a, a remnant. God always has a remnant who's going to walk the narrow path, who's going to follow him. And they are the ones who, do, who, who populate heaven. And so we meet Enoch, and his name means dedication. He's dedicated to the Lord even though it costs him. He stands up for godliness. He's not ashamed to say this is sin and this is right because God says so. In fact, it tells us later on, and remember we talked about in Jude where it talked about the, 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 the character of Cain who went in the way of Cain, those who were the counterfeit Christians. Well, then it contrasts that in verse 14 and 15 of Jude, and it says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all. To convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so here you've got Enoch saying, hey guys, don't go that way. Enoch in his day is already prophesied to his family. It would be, his, it'd be his, all his nieces and nephews and all that family saying, listen, don't go that way because God's going to judge you're going to stand before him someday. It's appointed a man wants to die. After this, the judgment. It's going to pay. There is a payment time. God is a holy God. You can't just go down this road and think that nothing's going to happen. And Enoch preached the truth to these people. Even beyond that, he even, not only does he preach it, but he names his son Methuselah. You may not under, or see that in the text of why that's important, but Methuselah means when he dies, it shall come. Well, what comes? Judgment comes. If you follow the line of Methuselah, the year that he dies, the flood happens. Did you know, by the way, Methuselah is the oldest person recorded for us in all of history? He lived 969 years. I think that's interesting because God's judgment, he's patient. He's giving times for repentance. He's giving time to turn back. And, the, and when the, the name is given, when he dies, he shall, it shall come. Judgment's coming. God says, I'm going to hold off my wrath. I'm going to hold off my punishment, giving them a chance to repent. Because God is a long-suffering God, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's his desire. So in the midst of all of this, as we see these lines woven, we see God's grace and his mercy and there is a faithful line who says no we're going to follow the lord and we're going to encourage others to do the same and god is gracious in this and so the world takes or we see that here with with enoch and enoch pleased god and he walked with god a walk is a regular consistent relationship and so going home was a natural continuation of a godly fellowship and so God took him home. Enoch never died. God just took him one day to be with him. I have no idea what that looked like. I read one time from a little girl that kind of thought in her mind that it was Enoch and God were out for a walk one day. And 
on, on the way back, Enoch said, well, I probably ought to turn back. And God said, well, you're closer to my house than you are to yours. Why don't you just come home with me? I have no idea if that's the way it worked. But they had a relationship. And God says, I'm just going to bring you home. And the line coming out from Enoch demonstrates that continued fellowship is his great-grandson is Noah. And it says of him in chapter 6, verse 9, Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. What a legacy. See the contrast? Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, I could not travel both. Take the road less traveled, and that will make all the difference. Which road are we going to take? Are we going to pursue after God or pursue after this world? We have a lot of people today think, I'm going to try to do both. It doesn't work. I'm going to try to do both. You're going down this path. C.J. Mahaney in his book, Worldliness, he made this statement. He said, if you're more excited about the release of a new movie or a video game than about serving the local church, if you're drawn to people more because of their physical attractiveness or personality rather than their character, if you're impressed by Hollywood stars or professional athletes regardless of their lack of integrity or morality, then you've been seduced by this fallen world. In contrast to that, in 1980, in Rwanda, who became a Christian, and he was forced by his tribe to either renounce Christ or be killed. The night before that took place, he wrote a letter. He was, by the way, the next day when that came about, he determined he was going to follow Christ, and they did kill him for his faith. But they found the letter in his room from what he had wrote the night before. He said, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My presence makes sense. My future is secure. So I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed vision, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide is reliable, and my mission is clear. So I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up for the cause of Jesus Christ. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till everyone knows, work till he stops me, and when he comes for his own... He'll have no trouble recognizing me because my banner will have been made clear. Let's pray. Father, as we think about that contrast, Lord, we live in a world that is attempting constantly to seduce us into the way of the world. That, that to, to allow ourselves to, to determine the, the, the rules and the standards of right and wrong. But God, you are an eternal God. Your word is settled in heaven. And you have a plan and a purpose and you desire and your standard is righteousness from us. And so God, I pray as we think about this this morning, help us to determine what our priorities are. Help us to determine and see clearly if, if we have attempted to make you into a, a God that we can control and form. God, thank you so much for your mercy that you would even allow us to hear these things and consider these things so that we could repent and get back on the right road. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. Thank you for loving us that even though the wages of our sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh God, thank you for that. It's a gift that we can't deserve. We can't pay for it. You gave it to us so we could get back on the right path in a relationship with you so we could be declared righteous. 
God, if there's any here today, they're on the wrong path. There's some priors out of place. And they need to get back right with you. Lord, may today they fall upon your mercy and your grace and turn back to you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed this morning. I just want to ask a question. Is there some areas in your life that you'd say, man, I have, I've made some choices that have got me on the wrong road. And I'm pursuing my own dreams. I'm pursuing me. And I've kind of pushed God to the, to the back burner. And I knew I needed to make some changes. And I need to do that. Would you, would you pray for me? Let me just acknowledge that, man, there's some changes you need to make. You're on the wrong path. You want to make some changes. Nobody's looking around. Would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. That you'd say, man, I need to make some changes in my life. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Amen. Anybody else? Say, there's some areas. I need to make some changes. Okay. Is there any here this morning that say, Pastor Shipe, I don't know that I've ever been made right with God. And I've attempted my whole life to try to earn my way to be good enough but I understand this morning that I can't do it on my own. I need, I need a perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I want to accept what he did for me on the cross. I want to be saved. Is there anybody here this morning that say, I need to be saved from my sins and to be forgiven through Jesus Christ? Would you just raise your hand and pray for you? I want to talk to you afterwards if I could. Okay. Well, let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time this morning just to be reminded of your plan. Sometimes it's, we lose sight of eternity. We lose sight of you. We lose sight of that we're just pilgrims on this earth. And there is eternity to gain. So God, I pray that you'd challenge us, that we would walk the narrow pathway, that we would proclaim the name of the Lord. And so, God, I pray that you'd challenge that. I pray for those who uh, this morning said, man, I, I need to make some changes. I, I'm on a wrong path. There's some things I need to do different. And I want to pursue Christ. God, I pray that you would, as they come to you and, and acknowledge that before you this morning, Lord, may you accept not only their, their, their cry for forgiveness, but, Lord, may you help them and strengthen them in a new journey, in a new walk with you, that they would leave a legacy for their family and for others behind them. Thank you for this time this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.